Okay, let's get started. Hello and welcome. Um, if you have any questions during the exhibit, please put them in the chat and the artist will answer them at the end of the program. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a celebration of Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Lucia Flores. I am a library assistant for Contra Costa County Library and a member of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusivity Committee that is proud to bring this program to you, generously sponsored by the Friends of the Hercules Library. Um, this afternoon, we will see and discuss the multidisciplinary traveling exhibition Caravana, mobilizing Central American art 1984 to present, previously featured at the Soam Arts Cultural Center. This exhibit examines the lived experiences of the artists in relation to the impacts of mass migration, family separation, and the legacy of political action and solidarity with the people of Central America. A Salvadorian curators raised in the US after their parents fled the Civil War, uh, Fatima Ramirez, Mauricio Ramirez, and Josue Rojas, as well as artists Rebecca Flores and Rafael Arena, drew inspiration from the 1984 artist call against U.S. intervention, which mobilized thousands of artists across the U.S. to join in the solidarity movement with the people of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. So let's take a look at a sneak peek of the virtual exhibition that's on the Soam Arts website. Um, uh, do we have, oh, here it is. And the link is going to be in the chat. So somarts.gov, Caravana Virtual Gallery. So if you go on the website, you can actually see it. All right, perfect. So please join me in welcoming our curators and artists for Caravana. Hello, everybody. I'm Fatima Ramirez, one of the co-curators of Caravana, and I'm here with our, um, with our other two uh, co-curators for this exhibition. And if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Mauricio Ramirez, also one of the curators and participating artists for the exhibition. Hi everyone, likewise, uh, my name is Josue Rojas and I am a participating curator as well as a participating artist. And I'm really grateful to be here with you all this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. And so um, just wanted to share, so what you're seeing on the screen from the virtual exhibition, um, this was for the um, exhibition that we did host in person at SoMarts um, earlier this year. It ran from March 10th to April 15th. And like we mentioned, you're welcome to check out the vir virtual rendition of this exhibition um, as well with the link that is provided there. Um, something that we're really proud of, you know, we, we were kind of just reflecting as curators as we prepared for today, um, that it's really exciting to now be on the other side after like, you know, working so hard to put together this exhibition during a pandemic and figuring out all of the logistics involved. Um, one of the things we were really proud of was to be able to feature such a, a broad, diversity, uh, broad diversity of Central American artists in the show and to be able to do that at a national level as well, um, which had been one of our, our hopes uh, to feature both uh, local Bay Area artists, but also um, include artists, um, you know, from as far as like uh, New York, um, Texas as well, LA, um, definitely a few different details to, to coordinate, but it allowed us to show um, a different Central American perspective. Um, and our hope was to be able to engage in a national conversation with other Central Americans about um, a lot of different topics, immigration uh, being one of them, um, the travel of unaccompanied minors, um, which made headlines in 2014, but continues to this day. Um, and of course, you know, because of um, um, also, you know, I think President 45 and the xenophobic messages that were being put out in our community, uh, when we reached out to the artists uh, who participated in the show, we wanted to um, hear, you know, how were they feeling about what was going on? Uh, many of us, like Lucia mentioned in the introduction, um, were born in the United States or, um, 
are the children of uh, uh, people who survived the uh, civil war uh, for us specifically in El Salvador, but you know throughout Central America. And we recognize that in the Bay Area specifically, there was a whole movement, um, especially throughout the 80s, of people in solidarity with Central America as well. And um, like we're seeing on the screen in San Francisco, that's very unique to, um, or that led to the creation of very special places such as Balmy Alley, which we can talk about later on. Um, so we wanted to be able to show that side by side, both um, Central American artists on the front lines, being able to share back their own stories, um, their own feelings about what was happening, um, and side by side with solidarity movements that have also been there all along. Um, and as we did that, you know, also not just focus on uh, those elements of struggle, but also to look at the joy uh, that also is within our communities and that we hope there will be more of in the future too. Um, so just wanted to share some words there for some context. Um, and today we're really excited to be able to um, have a conversation with two of the participating artists in this exhibition, Rebecca Flores, um, who is with us today, and also um, Rafael, um, who's here with us today as well. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Mauricio to start off um, the conversation with Rafael so we can also get to learn more about these artists and who they are and where you can also um, find more of their artwork and support them as well. So to start us off um, with Rafael Arana's um, piece, Rafael and I go way back. We're actually friends from probably what kindergarten. Um, and we went to school, we, we went to the same schools growing up. So all the way up through college and I think we both influenced each other to become artists. Um, we're very young, so I think we, we both would feed off each other's energy. But for sure, Rafael was an artist even before I was an artist, so I would always look up to his work. Um, anytime I would see his art um, in elementary school, I just thought it was amazing that he had such skill and talent already at such a young age. And so I'm not surprised that Raf ended up being an artist, a full-time artist, and, you know, both of us grew up in San Francisco, similar histories. I mean, again, uh, both our parents uh, come from El Salvador um, and very fortunate we met, right, in, in San Francisco. Um, but we, we've met a, a lot of other kind of, you know, Central Americans or folks that are from Central America and other parts of Latin America, right, growing up in San Francisco and went to schools, you know, in San Francisco. And, you know, our first schools were relatively close to the Mission District. And so we also grew up painting murals together um, through Presida Eyes muralists when we were young. Uh, Josue Rojas also has a history um, with Presida Eyes muralists as well. So to start us off, um, you know, I see this image, um, an image or painting you created. And when I first saw it, especially when I saw it um, in person, because it's, it's rather large um, when you go and see it in person. Um, the, the thing that stuck out the most was the colors. There was these um, vibrant colors um, that are in this portrait. And um, I guess first off, um, just talking about the content, um, could you tell us a little bit more about, I guess, um, your inspiration for this painting and also your own kind of trajectory as an artist? Raf, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, I was born and raised in San Francisco, um, as Mauricio said, um, Salvadorian. Um, I was heavily influenced by graffiti growing up at a very uh, young age. Um, I looked up to my cousin who was always drawing graffiti letters and like comic book characters. So I would emulate that and try to do that on my own from a very young age. So I've been practicing since I don't, since I could remember. And uh, I stuck to it. That was always my thing growing up. Um, and uh, in college, I majored in art, developed my skills. Uh, I work with acrylic paints. Um, and uh, yeah, now I'm a, a freelance artist, uh, mostly do murals. Um, and I work for interior design companies and some private clients. Um, 
most of my work now is in private homes. Uh, but recently I painted a large mural at Tusca Cafe, which is in North Beach in, in San Francisco. So you guys could go check that out. Um, so for, for this uh, particular piece, uh, last year, my sister was um, helping my mom um, organize a photo album and we came across a whole bunch of old pictures. And uh, so this picture right, oh, let's see. This picture right here caught my attention. For some reason, uh, I really, something about it, I was like, I'm keeping this one. So I took it home and uh, when it came time to like really start thinking about what I wanted to contribute and what I wanted to paint, um, I came back to this picture and I actually went over to my mom's house and kind of asked her about it. And it turned out like this was uh, a few years, um, maybe like three or four years after she came to the United States. and. Um, it was actually taken the year I was born. So it kind of gave it more significance for me. And I saw it kind of as like the beginning of her journey. Um, Cause I think before, before coming, her idea was to change her life. Cause she came from, you know, abusive parents, like extreme poverty. Like she, she lived a really hard life and she moved out here escaping that. And she came here with a lot of resentment, but she she knew she wanted something better for herself. And her idea, like many people who come out here, is you know they're going to come here, work hard, make money, and then possibly go back and help the family or maybe live a better life than they were. Um, but I think um, once I was born, once she met my dad, you know I think that kind of changed, and it it was a new start. And now she was working hard for me and to give me a better life and to give me the things that she didn't have so that's kind of what this picture this image kind of symbolized to me it was just like a new start in america um but yeah awesome um yeah. i wanted to talk about um well that's uh and in, you know i think a very personal story right and it's something that i think uh, this is what's great about knowing about the story behind the artwork is that sometimes you have no idea what the artwork is really trying to say but you know mm -hmm. when you add this personal element to it it lets us also know a lot more about you know where you're coming from um but another kind of i guess more of an aesthetic question and i, I find it really interesting because i do know that you also you know you create artwork um sometimes for commercial purposes right or you said you had you know clients um so was it uh, difficult to, to come up with something that was like more truly your own um, artwork? Because I know sometimes you, you tell me, you know, there's not instances where I can kind of create my own artwork. Um, how was that process like? Um, that, that process is always hard because yeah, most of the work I do now is, there's always like a direction and um, it's more of a collaborative effort. Um, but for this particular one, you know, something about I, it was just meant to be like I, like when you asked me what i was going to do like i didn't it was pretty quick I, my my mind went straight to this picture and i was like i think this is perfect like and and that's it drove me to go have a conversation with my mom and and it kind of all just happened naturally you know and and my goal was to bring this image to life you know, because it's kind of, you know, the colors are kind of dull, but like I, I kind of wanted to make it look like new, new beginnings. So I kind of like freshened up the colors and, and um, yeah. Yeah, that was another thing I did notice was that if you see this in person, it really pops like these colors are just kind of, you know, are really, you know, pop. It also reminds me a lot of, you know, I guess it's 1989, but it, it reminds me of the 80s kind of look, even, you know, what yeah. mom is wearing. Um, the yeah. colors, the pattern, you know, the dress, the attire. Um, so it's reminiscent of that past, too. And I think that's really interesting to think about, you know, the past and the present. Um, and sometimes how these things kind of spill over too. like, you know, 
the 90s, you know, sometimes the 80s, you know, every decade, it kind of spills over to the next decade, because 89 is that, you know, point of like, okay, well, now we're entering into the 90s. Also an interesting time to be, you know, um, like a Salvadoran American right here in, in, in the US in the city of San Francisco. Um, so yeah. I think that's, yeah, that's uh, a child, you know, of, of, of parents who are, are coming from El Salvador. Yeah. Um, and I think also, yeah, like you mentioned, one of the, my favorite parts of the, the, the image was definitely the shirt and just the style. I think she looked just fly. I was like, all right, I got, that's probably why I took it home with me. So I was like, all right, I got to do this. Yeah, the sunglasses too. That's yeah, also what yeah. gives it a little bit of an ominous look because you don't see the eyes. Um, right. But that all, that's also what makes it look cool, right? It's like, oh, uh, and a portrait. So why a portrait? Um, also, I mean, like, because there's different types of portraiture. If we look at like kind of the history of how, you know, portraits are represented. I think this was an interesting take on that because it's like the back of a car. Um, someone just, you know, your mom just hanging out. Um, and then it's based off a photo too. I think that's also, it's kind of that randomness about it. It's like, okay, this is just somebody, you know, took a photo and, um, but yeah, was there any other, you know, things that you like implied with, with, you know, having, you know, cause you could have, I guess, not had the car there, but I think having the car and then seeing some of the objects that are in the car also kind of makes it like a really interesting portrait. Yeah. That's why I, I had to go ask my mom about it. it. This was a camping trip she had with my dad and some friends. Um, but yeah. I mean, everything else is all in the picture. I was basically just copying what, what's on this, you know, so give you guys a better look at it. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing, Raf. And camping trip makes sense. I was seeing some uh, yeah. folks commenting in the chat, curious about the uh, half watermelon in the truck. So yeah. that makes <laughs> sense. It all adds up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I think I'm somewhere in there. I'm not in the picture, but I'm somewhere around there as a newborn. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I think I saw some hands up too from uh, Josue. Um, so I think I'd like to put a Josue first. I thought I saw a hand uh, from him earlier. And then um, we will be asking Rebecca questions too. But I saw, I think you also have a question, which is great because that'll make it even more dynamic that it won't just be curators asking artists questions, but y'all are welcome to ask questions from each other, you know, as you saw the work in the show. Um, so Josue, did you have a question? Yeah, I kind of had a, a comment. I was actually trying to find the um, little emojis that like show the hearts and the, I, for some reason I don't have that right now, but uh, I just wanted to give a quick heart. But um, I just really love about both these pieces, but particularly uh, right now in the painting of Rapa's, the, the comment that I was going to say is, I really love that as we're trying to find a language to tell the Central American stories um, and talk about our experience, um, there's so much that we're pulling out of this, you know, this photograph and this conversation that you've had and the Paleta experience. Um, I love that, you know, as we're defining this, we have the power and the right as young artists uh, and creators, um, even though there is this precedent, right? We've seen the Balmy Alley and the call for from the 80s, but we have this, um, we have what I'm seeing in the artist is the power to kind of evolve and there is no set definition for what Central American art should look like, right? There isn't like, um, no disrespect because these are my heroes, but it doesn't have to look like a Diego or a Frida, right? Uh, I think this looks a little bit more like a, uh, a Chuck Close or like someone, someone in the comments said like a, like a Nagel um, than it does like a, um, like a Diego or a Frida. And I just think that it's so kind of modern and, and fun with both of your pieces. So I just want to commend, um, commend that and just <clears throat> comment that and feel free on, to riff off, off of that or not. But um, mm -hmm. just pointing out a little bit of something here that we just went to my thoughts. And I just love <clears throat> the pose of this. It's both joyous um, and defiant. Yes. Something about it is like, I, oh, I wish you would try to take my watermelon or something like, it's just like, there's some power in her in her in her in her posture um, that I just really enjoy, and even just like you know the way you uh, kind of rendered stuff like um, 
the back of the uh, the kind of ceiling piece of the hood of the car is just uh, really fun abstractions. Uh, it's just really, really a great painting. Oh man, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, to um, to a point, I was like, there is this sort of like audacious nature of like the, the pose, but also um, for me personally, like the color. Can you talk about like why you chose yellow? I love it. I just love this yellow. What was that choice or decision like? That, that was the last decision I made. Uh, before it was yellow, it was like a coral pink. Um, and it worked, but I felt like there was a better color. And then so I, I like to play with uh, contrasting colors. So you, you see the reds and the, and, and then the, that's why the, the, uh, the sandia stands out a lot, it's that green right there. But then I, the other color that stood out to me was the, um, the blue, which you could see kind of in the background. So I was like, all right, maybe yellow might make this thing come alive and kind of just went for it. It was, it was like last minute decision. Um, and it took like four coats to, to really get it there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's like all this aesthetic kind of just looking at it. Yeah. It just kind of like reminds me of like the sun and this like idea that like, you know, like you're saying like the journey, like something new is going to come and like, it's just so like, it's audacious to be like, let's go into the sun, let's go and dream and have this big yellow represent. Yeah, yeah definitely, beautiful. definitely. Yeah, the, it, I just wanted really to make it come to life and make it look fresh and, you know, just like, just new beginnings, like, yeah. I'm seeing a comment from Christian Gonzalez. It says, yellow is hella powerful in this piece. I actually think it's kind of awesome that you commented on it, Rebecca, because that's the same exact color of your paleta. Paleta's orange. Yeah. Oh, is it? oh, I'm sorry, it's not. Okay, sorry. It's a, it's a similar family of worms, forgive me. Yeah, which I was going to comment on. Um, and I also see another comment here about folks saying, great choice, reminiscent of all the tones of nuestros pueblos in Latino America. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, definitely reminds you of like the very bright colored walls. And yeah, thank you for that, Jose, because that's exactly what I was going to comment on as well, that in the show, we had uh, Raf's piece, I think they were literally right next to each other, right? Or at least like very mm -hmm. close in proximity in the show. And yes, uh, Rebecca, your paleta is orange, and maybe Mauricio can uh, move on to the next image so we can um, check that one out as well. There it is. Uh, and I recall you saying it was mango flavored. Was that right? Um, and, and so I want to talk a little bit more about the piece, but I also want to give folks a chance to get to know who you are, um, where you're from, and to tell us a little bit more about your artistic journey. Mm -hmm. um, so you're currently based in the Bay in Oakland, um, but tell us a little bit about where you grew up um, and any influences along the way for, for you to you know really dive into being an artist um, and a conceptual artist and sculpture maker um, in this regard. Yeah, um, so I'm, I live in Oakland, but I'm from, Fresno, California. Um, my dad is a refugee from El Salvador and my mom is um, from the Mixteca people and her, uh, her people are from Oaxaca, but she grew up in Guerrero and she migrated here to the US and that's where they met and had me and they met in a church and we still drive by that church in Fresno and they're like, that's where we met and that's where we got married and that's where you were presented. And so it's like, um, so I, I very much grew up here in California. And so I think, uh, I don't know how like be, being an artist started. I just knew that I observed the world a lot growing up. Um, my parents are were, were field workers and then they moved on to be housekeepers. And so I grew up like following them around and like helping with the housework and like work. We worked in the summers cleaning, um, we cleaned apartments in like the in the north side of Fresno, and so just spent a lot of time like hanging out at but working together, and so I I think I absorbed that, and I just really always had questions about that, and so when I went to um, school and college, I I noticed that like I I knew I liked words and I knew I liked colors but they were never put together. And I didn't know why we were allowed to like play with them together until I went to college and 
I found myself in this in this lab where uh, people worked with words and colors and put them together. And so that's pretty much where I started to really like really get the opportunity to play with my ideas. And so I think that as I keep growing and I still consider myself a baby artist, um, as I keep growing and I, I look at the uh, from like the life that I come from and the people I come from and I my parents still work, you know, cleaning, they clean a they clean up an elementary school and they're in their like their 60s. So, you know, that's that's the work that they're gonna do for like the rest of their lives. My dad didn't go to didn't go to elementary school. My mom never saw a classroom. And so I kind of just like I always felt like that would be my path too. And being an artist kind of opened that path a little bit more to show me like my parents work every day and like these very laborious conditions and they made an artist, they made someone who thinks and someone who wants to give color to um, people who work and have to live that way. And I, I think that's that's what they did. And I, so I, I feel like they made an artist. I don't know if I'm making an artist, but I definitely think that they made one. That's beautiful. I love how you express that. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Um, and thank you for talking. There's, uh, I want to get into this a little bit more too for your piece because I know, I think throughout your work, um, the fact that you, you know, you participated in some of the work that your parents did, uh, or continue to do. Um, I know, like, the concept of labor and also now with talking about joy is very um, goes hand in hand with your work. Um, and I think that was, I remember when you said that, that also just made such a an impact because um, I know at least for you know many of of the artists that are in the show and, and also for our curatorial team, like that's also the background of our parents of like working in cleaning industries. Um, you know, for my own mom, she worked in hotels, like cleaning hotel rooms for like 14 years, which is why I specifically wanted to include, um, we have another part of our exhibition uh, where we featured a photographer, Mario Quiroz, um, who had all of these different photographs of um, Salvadorans with uh, TPS right, with a temporary protective status. Um, and one photo in particular was of a, a lady uh, who cleans hotel rooms. And I was like, that reminds me of my mom. Like, I think that's, a, you know, also would remind other folks of their own experience uh, and experiences mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, so kind of just with that in mind, um, can you speak a little bit about that too, of just this relationship between like the labor, the joy, because I got so excited. Um, we were talking about themes for the show and, and we said, you know, we don't want it to be all doom and gloom. We don't want it to be just reliving all of this trauma that we know our artists are going to go through as they think about their pieces for the show. But we also want there to be joy and optimism and um, and these beautiful reflections of like from yeah. this labor and this journey from our parents, they birthed yeah. an artist, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, can you speak a little bit to that about the relationship of joy and labor in your work? Yeah. Um... That's a really good question, and one I I always try to like um, the one the one that ponders the one that gets me you know thinking and stuff. And I I think the relationship that I had with joy was for a long time it was like well joy is a luxury like joy is something that like isn't available to all of us and some of us just have to like sit and like process trauma and the pain that's happened you know um, my you know the people who came from El Salvador, they, they were fleeing a war. Like there's just so much um, darkness there. But, and then they came here in, in, in hopes that, you know, their children would have access and like opportunity and just have a life not with that darkness. And I think um, it's funny too, cause I think my, my dad has this, like everybody has that little shot of like the vaccine, right? That old school one. And I remember going to like, when I was little, like going to like the, the, the clinic so I could get my like rubella shot for, you know, all those like random shots. And he was like, you know, like, this is my dream. My dream was that my kids would have this, this freedom and this access. And so I think once I started to like see joy as more of a necessity and something that we actually have to like take part in, like the labor is how we make our lives and what sustains us so that we can pay rent and eat food, but this joy is what's gonna keep us alive, you know? Like, and I started to see that in everywhere that I went, like my my dad has the nicest yard, his cherry tree is beautiful, his lawn is 
green manicured perfect and I'm just and I start to see it like oh that's where the joy is it's in this in this um, curation of like land that he like takes care cares of and gives back to him so like finding that joy in where we live our lives is sort of like where I had to start framing that in myself and so then when it came to making um things as an artist I'm just like I really always want to talk about that relationship because I don't want to leave out the pain but I don't want to see joy as a, a luxury it's a necessity too yeah thank you for sharing that uh do any of our um, I don't know Josue or Mauricio or even Raf if you have um, um some thoughts on what Rebecca is sharing and and here on the screen we're seeing the other element um to your piece too, which we could talk about after, because I know that also has a whole other story, Rebecca. Uh, but um, the way that this was showcased in the exhibition is we had the paleta and we had this media uh, piece side by side. Um, so I know there's definitely a story there, but um, first I wanted to ask if any folks had any just reactions to what you shared just now. If not, we can dive into the, the media piece there. Well, I really just want to just echo something beautiful that was just said, just like joy as a necessity is something I'm going to put in my pocket and keep uh, in my heart forever, because that's just a really powerful comment. I just want to point one quick thing out, and that is um, just the, the power of our families, really, uh, that people are kind of pointing out a theme that I see, you know, Raf. Uh, your, your work really centering your mom and, and you know, you're, you're identifying with her story and Rebecca as well. And um, it's just something that I um, just would urge our uh, audience to really pay attention to and, 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 the, and folks, because if you look, there's so many examples. I don't want to give any spoilers, but um, I think um, within the work of Oriel and in the work of um, even of Maria Esther Garcia and so many others is such a familiar, familial thing. And again, I won't spoil because I wouldn't want to um, give away the, uh, the uh, Easter eggs for y'all to find, but I think uh, there's some really powerful um, familial examples in, in these pieces that are co a commonality. So I'll just leave it at that. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for that, Josue. Um, and also we do, um, I know the, the link to our virtual exhibition is going to be um, shared again um, throughout this event, but we do highly encourage everyone to check out, um, you know, the many other artists that also participated in this exhibition. Thank you. Um, because, yeah, like you mentioned, you made a reference to Oriel, for example. Um, Dr. Oriel Maria Su is a children's book author, which again, like, was very, you know, featured in close proximity to both um, Roth and Rebecca's pieces. Uh, which of course we did very intentionally because um, we'll do a quick plug sort of just for her book um, called Rebeldita um, uh, en el país de los ogros is what it is in Spanish and I think you could also find it in English in the um, in the exhibition um, but we thought it was fascinating you know that she had uh, it's a children's book first of all right so all of the characters are kids but I remember when I got that book, like I held it close to my heart. I was like, this is also for me. Like, this is also for the kid inside of me who didn't have these books like growing up and who also is like still healing from some of this stuff that I didn't even know. Sometimes we don't realize, right? The stuff that we carry with us as we like navigate different experiences. Um, so I felt so much joy in just like opening up the book and, and like uh, Rebecca was talking about seeing that beautiful connection of words and images, right? Like that's powerful when you're able to see yourself reflected back, um, your family's experiences in such a bright and colorful way, even if maybe the stories they're talking about um, can be really profound and really heavy um, to hold. So thank you uh, for mentioning that, Josue. Um, yeah, and so I wanted to uh, give a moment to also speak to um, the story that you're telling here with your complete piece with Paleta y el Paletero, which again, I think builds off of what we were talking about, right? Of, of joy is necessity and the labor and the work um, involved. But do you want to talk a little bit more about that, Rebecca? Yeah, um, so I think Paleta, I remember the day too, we were sitting in my sister's living room and it was one of those um, Fridays, pandemic, nothing happening. What other movie are we gonna watch for the 50th time, fit indoors all day? And I, I was like, 
I don't know. They were talking about moving and I'm like, I don't know. I don't care. Like, I just need to like, I, I, I just, I was like, I need large joy. I don't know how that can happen, but I just, I just need to be in that. And so then um, I went to the gas station to get gas and I saw these paletas and I was like, paleta would make me really happy. And so I bought one and then I was like, what, make, what would make me even happier is to see this be humongous. And so then that night I started working with um, cardboard and I started to like tape one together and started to like, okay, how would this work? Could, how would this be able to be imagined? And then I, and then me and a friend, I was like, hey, like I'm trying to make this paleta. Like, do you have any advice? And he's all like, yeah, you know, we could start walking the alleys and see if we find some wood. And so we did that. And so we walked around and found like three pieces of wood. And then we like, Put them together and then we like held it down and he cut that side and then i held it down it was like a, a very like a communal thing that happened and so it brought me joy to make it and then it just gave me so much joy to like see it and i think that's the joy that we feel when we see paletas and when we see el paletero because there's almost like possibility of like what am i gonna get which one's gonna be like good like what do you want like kind of this this transaction of joy that happens and so then um the paletero was like a very easy addition because when like when the paletero leaves like you know there's going to be another one and you know that that joy is going to come back but it's almost nice to like have them go away from the paleta because you have that joy now and so then you can go and give someone else joy and then it'll come back when you need it and so that's kind of like the relationship that i wanted to like that i have with paletas that i wanted to like show Thank you for sharing that. And again, I think you've given us another um, nugget here of, I don't just need joy, I need big joy, uh, which I think is also fantastic. And thinking about measuring that, I guess, in quantities. Um, and uh, I love that you, we definitely had questions about just like the way it was built. Cause I remember when you brought it into the, also into the show, um, it had diff many different layers to it. And you mentioned there was like a, I don't know if it was a seamstress or a tailor also involved to help with like the canvas um, and all of that. So yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more about the details? Because I also love that it, it was collaborative. Like not only you have the vision for what this big joy was going to be and how it was going to be represented through this mm -hmm. like mango flavored paleta, um, yeah. but it also involved several people. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a feat to get it done. Um, so because there was there's like three different kinds of wood in it, um like there's some gaps in it and that I wanted to didn't want to leave anything open because paletas don't have anything open so then I was like okay how can I cover it and so I thought of like uh making like pretty much it's a giant pillowcase that is going over the paleta and so made out of canvas and so then I I went to Home Depot and I got the canvas and then I wrapped it around and I cut it and then I like pinned it to make it fit and so then um Unfortunately, I am not a, a seamstress and don't have that that gift. And so I, I went to one in the East Bay and I was like, so I have this, I have this large thing. Can you put it together for me? And it's pretty funny because the, the seamstress looked at it. It's just, they're like, no. And I was like, no, it, it's not possible. He's like, not impossible, just hard. And I was like, is that a yes? And they're like, we'll try. And so the, they went away and then I didn't hear back from them for about three days. And then finally I gave them a call and I was like, hey, how's it looking like? And they're like, we'll do it. We'll be ready on Saturday. <laughs> and then so then I go on Saturday to pick it up and it looked amazing. And um, it looked really great. And it was funny because they were like, the seamstress is so bored. Of, she told me to tell you that they're so bored of like pants and skirts. So it was really awesome to like flex their muscle and like, on, on something new and they're like they're like bring back your projects and I was like thank you thank you thank you and so then I came back and I put it on and then um it was just a whole thing and so it pretty much kind of like um I don't know also brought back that thing that I was trying to like do I was like trying to bring joy back into my life and then like sharing with people and sharing like art with people and like sharing your own ideas and like seeing something come to life and that like community aspect was like also the fun part of being an artist too and like that gave me joy and stuff and so i i like felt like 
this community thing is something that I miss during the pandemic. It was so away from everyone. So I was like, oh, it's, it's back. Like, thank you for helping me. I was like, I had, I was a mad woman. I was just bringing these like ideas and somebody was like, got you. And that made me feel happy. And I don't know, that, that, that was the whole I, idea of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for telling that. I remember um, just being, again, so excited to hear more about your process and all of the behind the scenes um, stories that I think, you know, a lot of folks don't get to, to learn or to hear about when they just go and check out an exhibition, right? So thank you for sharing that. Um, I also had a question for Raf and wanted if our curators want to chime in here as well too, but um, I'm curious, Raf, in talking about um, your your painting, right, and talking about how personal it is and how it led you to have conversations with your mom and, um, uh, yeah, basically um, learn a little bit more about your family's history. Um, again, like given the the different uh, context in which you work, right, and like with interior design firm and, and with different projects, I'm curious about, you know, how it felt like for you, because I know you got a chance to come in and check out the exhibition and you actually brought your family, I think, too, mm -hmm. right, to be able to check out the show and check out the other paintings um i'm just curious about um you know what kind of what's come next for you as you've been thinking about your your next projects and if um participating in the show gave you any um you know feelings of wanting to maybe explore this further of looking to other pieces maybe of um either family or just like ways of depicting um your central american heritage yeah definitely um yeah, especially this year and, and, and starting with that conversation, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, up until now I didn't really understand about, you know, how my mom is because throughout our years it's been a struggle because we're both like strong characters. We clash a lot, but like through conversation I've been and also my maturity, just um, just understanding her path and why the way why she is the way she is. Um, I'm getting more clarity on that and I'm able to like just understand and see her more as like a superhero for all that she's done, all that she's done for me and my sisters. And, um, you know, even in this, in this, uh, painting, she, she looks like a boss and, and that's, that's what she is. Like she's been able to, she came from nothing and now she has three amazing kids and, she's she's made it out here she has properties in el salvador she has her retirement set up like she's come from nothing and she's made a lot happen just through hard work um and as far as like future work i definitely want to continue on this path um it's just really hard with work um and finding the time because it's a it's a lot of effort um and a lot of hours go go into this and as it should, it's 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 powerful work, and it's it's a it's a it's my story, and it's, it's a story that should be shared. But you know, it's just time. Like when, when <laughs> I like this year, especially, I'm like, man, there's really not enough hours in the day. Like, um, but yeah, definitely when I when I when I get the time, I, I definitely want to continue on um, and and push this this side, you know, and because usually my work is is uh, doesn't really come. It's not really telling my story. It's more catered to the client, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. And this too, um, um, I'm wondering, I don't know, Jose, if you would like to share, but um, you're also a full time artist and maybe could speak a little bit to what that journey has been like for you because you also are an artist. You were both artist and curator for our Caravana exhibition. Um, and after our exhibition, naturally, already throughout the exhibition, you were, you were a full time artist. And I've had a lot of different projects um, since then. So if you'd like to speak a little bit to what that's been like for you and, and that journey. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it is. Um, I think COVID really shook up. You know, if, if I was a tree, COVID really shook me up. And then I just, it just uh, made loose a lot of things that need to be loose. More than anything, the fruit that I was kind of bearing and it started to get heavy on me. So uh, it shook it all up and lo and behold, I was like, oh wow, look at all that. That's on the ground that I can do and give. And so um, I think it was just a reminder for me personally that I am first an artist 
Um, and um, I, throughout my life, I've done a lot of different things to survive. I've, I've been a journalist and an artist. I've been a teacher and an artist, most recently an arts admin uh, and an artist in the community. And I trust me, I do not, um, I would never change those experiences because they really uh, enriched everything of who I am as a human. Um, but it really um, is the first time in, the, in this year, in 2021, that I've been able just to say that I'm uh, an artist first. And so, or an artist kind of alone, you know? And to be perfectly honest with you, um, it is the scariest thing that I've ever done in the history of my life. It was completely horrifying. Not only for the money and the rent, like that's just, that's the easy one. Um, the looking in the mirror and saying, what the hell am I gonna do? It's not like you, you face a fear. Um, it's not like, oh, I faced a fear and I, and I vanquished this fear. It's like, no, I signed up to face a fear every day is, is what I signed up to do. And um, lo and behold, uh, when as happens with most of the things that we're afraid of, it's never as bad as the, the moment that we fear it. And so um, I uh, am still standing and I'm still here and uh, I'm gonna keep doing this as long as um, makes sense. And uh, it's just been a real gift, you know, to be able to get up in the morning and, and, and do this and, and just kind of wear overalls and make a painting. And so um, I know it's definitely not, it's not for, um, you know, you have to choose that path. And so I'm really uh, blessed to, to, to have that and, uh, and really to share the space back to, the, to the, this exhibition. This exhibition was really also, and even at this very moment, such a learning experience to just hear um, all of our different journeys and our different paths. Um, and it really brings me to something that really, I just feel that not only has been missing uh, in the landscape of uh, art, community art, Latinx art, but um, it's really special and necessary. I just think that um, the more I think about it, the more the work that we've been able to put together here as a group um, is really needed and, uh, and important to hear that voice of um, Central American creatives. Um, so yeah, um, in this piece, I mean, I, I chose to sort of really go into the, um, the history um, you know, of being a, of being a, a Salvadoran, a Central American. And I, I made a promise that when I was working as a journalist many years ago, uh, I think I was in my like college and someone, um, one of my just kind of white um, sort of college uh, friends stepped to me and was like, yo, do you know about El Salvador? And like started to educate me about the stuff that I didn't know about El Salvador. And I really owe that person a lot because I said, okay, I'm never gonna let anyone know more about Central America than me. And of course, there's a million people who know so much more, um, but I really wanted to just know. And so I just really wanted to, um, it really helped me embark on a journey to learn as much as I could about the region, about how the countries interact, um, you know, just about my own history. At that point, I didn't, I hadn't really visited this at that or Nicaragua or Guatemala as much as I would have liked to. And so I started going in there and interviewing people and talking to folks and interviewing migrants. And, and that was a lot of the journalism that I did for many years, which turned around and fed the art practice. And so um, this is kind of an expression of that, you know, just kind of like the beats. It's kind of like the, what I felt was punchy moments in Centam and Salvadoran history, kind of put together as a mixtape as sometimes when you go back to, um, El Salvador, there'll be a guy or, or some folks out on the in the tianguis or in the flea markets selling you cumbia mixtapes. So this, in my mind, um, is kind of a big mashup of a cumbia mixtape, of, um, in chronological but not really chronological, of some of the hits historically um, that we've seen. And so that's a shot of trying to do that. Awesome, thank you, Josue. Um, did you have a, a question, Rebecca? Yeah, um, can you talk about like the decision to like, it, look, it looks like a map, but like a sound wave too, like like a ripple. Like, what was like, 
were those, those choices like? Thanks for that question. Yeah, it's actually taken from an epicenter, like an epicenter image of an earthquake. And so uh, I guess, the, yeah, um, knock on wood, the, you know, the shaking up, the shaking up of, 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 of stuff. And um, we said about has certainly seen some, some shaking up. And so I really wanted to talk about um, of that. And it's kind of a, um, it's kind of just a, uh, yeah, just like that ripple graphic that I really wanted to even subconsciously kind of resonate with um, and even resonance, right? And so um, it's really interesting, some of the stuff, and I, I guess, I don't know if I said this sort of, um, if I set out to do this sort of consciously or subconsciously, but, you know, to think about the things that my parents dealt with uh, and that I and that somehow rears her head up into my story that I also have confronted and I'm actively confronting. Um, it's part of that ripple effect of, of uh, generational joy, generational trauma, generational approaches to things. And so I think we're in a really beautiful place as young Central American creatives because we get to choose which parts we'll take with us into the future and which parts we can leave behind um, as far as what can hurt us and what can help us. And so um, I think that's part of that looking back and also being able to look into the future. Thank you for sharing that. And I know we're I think probably gonna head into questions um, in a moment too, but um, I think as we've been having this conversation about you know family, um, you know, something also just popped into my mind as well about, you know, even us as curators, right? Like we saw Mauricio earlier. Um, he is my partner and we are, have, a, you know, a beautiful three or three and a half year olds um, now as well. And I think it was a big, um, you know, impetus for this show too and this exhibition. Again, from the conversations our curatorial team had um, in just reflecting about our families, again, what we were seeing in, um, in the media, um, and how we were also just, you know, again, as we were looking at the heavy images, like witnessing separation of families, and again, just the xenophobia and, and those messages um, that uh, we were, you know, feeling bombarded with. At the same time, like, we were trying to channel our joy, again, bringing it to that, into this exhibition and thinking about, you know, both of us as children of Salvadoran refugees now growing up and have grown up and now raising um, our son, you know, what would we hope for him um, growing up in the States and with this environment um, uh, that we were seeing? And, and yeah, thank you for sharing this image too, Mauricio, because this one was also a powerful one um, that we wanted to, to showcase, uh, right, in terms of uh, our childhoods, our, our own childhood, but also as we look back to the past and, um, and to the present as well. Um, yeah, so it just made me think about, again, like how you see family really as a thread throughout this exhibition and throughout our own stories and journeys, I think for the artists who are speaking here today as well and for curators too. Do we have uh, any questions yeah, from the audience? Don't see any questions in the chat. Do you guys wanna say anything else before we finish up? I guess something I was gonna ask just on that same topic of joy, you know, just to ask for uh, our curators and our artists as well of what comes to mind for you when you think about Central American joy and what does that for you? Because we heard from Rebecca about like paleta, big joy, you know, what is the equivalent of that for each of you? Cheesy pupusas and um, pan, pan guatemalteco and some coffee in the morning and a big paleta. All of those things at the same time. Yes, that's a feast. Yeah. That's a stomach ache. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> sure, your headache. Yeah, I guess for me right now, 
uh, at this moment is just spending time with uh, my family. Like, definitely, that's that's joy for me. There's a question in the chat. Uh, curious about if you have advice to any people about studying Latin American art, history, culture, maybe naming one thing or one person that is emblematic of your journey. I feel like that's a great question for you too, Mauricio, if you want to answer that. <laughs> that's a complicated one because there's so much, um, <laughs> there's so much out there. When we say Latin America, it's like a lot of countries, right? When we think about, um, but I would say in the Latinx, uh, it's just, I would say Latinx, the U.S. Latinx, so, you, you know, U.S. Latino art, you know, of, of the United States um, is definitely like a growing subfield, I would say. And I think there just needs to be more about it. So that means people need to write about it. People need to also invite their, you know, Latino or Latinx friends to create art, you know, maybe do joint art exhibitions or just exhibit more. That's why this was very unique and special because, you know, to say, you know, to have a, a Central American art exhibition is really rare. I mean, for those who are in kind of the art scene, um, a themed show like this one uh, doesn't happen too often. And so we were really lucky to have some art sponsor this um, and see our vision through because we were able to create something that I think was, you know, really unique and, and really, really necessary for the times and seeing everything that's happening with migration, right? Latinx migration. Um, and it's still in the news, right? It remains in the news, right? Central American migration to the US, um, right now we're saying, you know, Haitians, right, uh, at the border. And just, you know, I say there's, there's a lot of uh, complexity to it. Um, I don't really want to name, you know, uh, names, right? Because I think there's also, you know, academics out there that are really doing some great work um, around Latinx art, um, but specifically Central America as well. I mean, I would name Kenzi Cornejo if you ever want to check out her work in art historian. Uh, Tatiana Reynosa has also um, written a lot about this. Um, Carrie Cordova, you know, she has a whole book on San Francisco Latinx art. Um, Ana Patricia Rodriguez talks about some of the history of, of, of art, specifically Central Americans in, in San Francisco and also DC, Washington, DC. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, you know, those are just some of the folks that, are, you know, are, are doing some of that work, but um, that's just Central America. When we expand to Latinx art, there's a lot, a lot of, um, I would say Arlene Davila has some great books, a, a new book called Latinx Art. If you really want to know kind of the hidden nuances between Latinx art being exhibited in, you know, some of these mainstream galleries, it, it's very um, complex to think about, right? But I think Latinx art hopefully is going to grow within you know, maybe not just, I would say, um, I, was, I, I want to say maybe in, in culture, right? And just US culture. I, I hope to see more Latinx art being exhibited and appreciated and written about and, you know, documented. Yeah, thank you, Mauricio. I think the documentation piece is key. Um, and I think we're, we've been seeing, uh, I think we, we use this term a lot actually as we were curating um, a renaissance right, of seeing a renaissance of media makers, of artists, and particularly, I think, for, for Central Americans, um, which is really exciting and fun for us as curators to be able to identify more and to see a movement, um, a Central American art movement. Um, and this is both like within Central America, the region, and also in the States, uh, which we also want to continue to explore and explore that dynamic and the Central American diaspora at large. That was one of the reasons, too, why um, I think Lucia mentioned early on that our hope was for this show to be um, to travel and to be able to go to different locations so that we could explore the different context of what it means to be Central American in different regions of the country. And Mauricio, you were doing a lot of name dropping earlier. <laughs> um, we have a request if you could put one or a couple of those names in the chat. Please. Sure. Yeah, Thank I'll you. do that right now. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for coming and for sharing this with the community. Um, so yeah, I mean, this was really, this was a really great exhibit. I really appreciate you guys coming out for us. So thank you. Um, and let's see, I would also like to thank Gia and Allison for helping organize this wonderful program. Um, I want to, oh, looks like Josue put some names in the chat for you. Oh, and, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean, we didn't have to, 
address. I just wanted to drop some names in there too. Okay. <laughs> and then Gia also shared the the link for the virtual gallery in case anyone wasn't able to click on that earlier. But um, I did want to remind everyone we're having one more program to celebrate Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month on Tuesday, October 12th. Please join us for California's Lowrider Culture Panel discussion. And please register on our website using the link in the chat. Let's see. Let's see if it gets put in there. There's some more names. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of that. I'll have opened the doors. Now you're going to get all the names. <laughs> there it is. That's the link for the, the Lowrider Culture Panel discussion. So thank you so much. And I did want to say one thing, uh, Rafael. I accidentally said Arena earlier when I was introducing you. And it's oh, Arena. Yeah. So I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> okay. yeah, no worries. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, Rebecca and, and Raf. For yeah, for sure. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Lucia, too. I think it was you who commented that you were going to be including Rebelita. Uh, book. Uh, yeah, I put in a request. Um, there's no guarantee it'll be approved, but I put in a note that I really want it approved. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. And I saw yeah. that the English one's going to be published in February, I think it said. It's yeah, I think it, I thought I saw, um, I think it's already out in English, actually, and she has her second book out now as well. So there's okay. also a sequel for anybody who wants to check that out, which is, um, um, a reference more to Christopher Columbus, I think, uh, and again, going off of the ogre, ogre cologer kind of thing, which is also like an introduction um, to colonization, but for kids, from a kid's perspective. That's so um, cute. And <laughs> it's amazing. I like that. <laughs> yeah, again, the illustrations are like beautiful and bright and yeah, and you know, Ariel is also just a fantastic writer. So it's also just very poetic as you read it. Okay. Is it like a picture book or is it like a chapter book? Picture book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But again, like I said, they're children's books, but adults will want to pick them up too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I just, I mostly just wanted to say thank you for doing that because uh, anytime that I have conversations with other Central American folks too, you know, even beyond art, you know, sometimes it's cooking. And folks will say like, I can't find any books on Central American cooking. Yes. And I think was, someone did research on it and there's like one book, uh, one or two books, I think it was, uh, but they're super hard to find. You have to basically go to eBay to like find them because they're not widely accessible or available for folks. So again, that's kind of what I mean with the Renaissance is that now I've, um, I've been following this other channel called Salvi Soul. She's creating her own cookbook. She's like, okay, they're not out there. I'm going to make my own and I'm going to talk to my grandma and I'm going to talk to family and we're going to collect those recipes. Now, in addition, I think she's, she's still preparing to actually publish the book. And as a way to fund it, she's doing these different cooking workshops uh, for people to be able to join and learn of the history as she gets ready to publish this book. I just found the Instagram page for it. So I'm going to yeah. follow. <laughs> Check her out. She's Thank awesome. you. Yeah, I realized by some of the questions we were getting, I was like, that's right, we're with library folks. Of course, we all want to know about like information and the books. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for, for reaching out to us and involving us uh, with today's presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much, that was wonderful. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> hosting us. I mean, it was Sure, it was good. of course. Yeah. yeah I good. actually wish we could have done this with all the other artists. I mean, <laughs> cause they all had, so, you know, very specific, like meaning or intention behind their artwork, where, you know, the general audience doesn't know, but when you go and talk to them, it's like, oh, there's all these meanings behind their work, so. Right. Yeah, I do feel like one hour was like perfect though, to be able to like really dive deeper for two artists, at least, mm -hmm. and learn a little bit more about their background and their work. Yeah. If okay. we get any like follow up questions about how to find more of your guys' art, is there somewhere I can direct them? Yeah, that's to? what I was going to say. I was like, I think it'd be good for um, 
Raf and maybe Rebecca specifically so that oh, we right. can direct people to their websites or their Instagrams um, so people can check out stuff. Like Raf yeah. takes commissions a lot too. So, you know, who knows? Maybe if someone wants to feature his artwork, um, you know, they can reach out to him too. Okay. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Just have a good rest of your day. You too. Right. Thank you so you much. Too. Bye. 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 -bye. Okay.